So my name is John Geist again, and um, I've got a name tag in case. Uh, so what I'm talking about is how to lead and manage a chapter event. Okay, so I think it's good to for us to really understand, you know, how you know how to lead and manage a chapter event. I think we need to first understand what we do, and this is uh, really. A tough question for nonprofits. Uh, one of Jody's favorite questions: <laughs> What do you do? Um, it's a great question, and it really forces a nonprofit to really, you know, sink their teeth into the mission and make it really practical. So, a lot of people, and you know, you've heard a lot of a lot of great uh, talks about the Catholic social teaching. But what does that mean? Okay, so we heard all that. Now, what do we do? And most lay people that, you know, like Father was saying, they are down on, not at the, the doctoral level, they want action, they want to do something. So how many of you, uh, there's basically, uh, there's just a, several key elements of what we do, um, and I, I want to see how many of you know or can help me, like with everyone else, tell me what, that, what those are. Who knows what we do? What does Vocari do? <laughs> actually, uh, somebody already, uh, somebody pointed to it already. Literally, actually pointed to it just now. Yeah, right. And our, our board member Diego actually wrote it right on the board. So. The Bukhari movement, the mission is to call, educate, unite, and engage, or call, unite, educate, and engage. I think this actually flows better according to the order of way things happen. We call out to fellow Catholics, and then in calling and bringing them in, we unite them. So even before you, you guys could come here and be ed, uh, actually uh, educated, you had to actually get here, right? So we had to bring everybody together. So... I just actually made that change while we were sitting over there, but I was sitting over there. But I think that's actually more appropriately the 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 order of how things will work at the local level. You'll actually go out and call and share this great news that you know Father just talked about and Sarah and David you know really elucidated. That's the beauty and the enthusiasm of what we have. This incredible treasury of truth that we're going to go out and and you know share with others uniting them into uh, a group of Catholics and like-minded people to actually do something. Okay, so that's the, the first part is to educate. So we educate people. That's, the Catholic Church is the best at that. You know, we have the, the most profound teaching, uh, at least the teaching anyway. We're good at the te- the, They have the doctrine down that we need, to, we need to take the education, though, on the social teaching, which is not so well known. And most people... Uh, how many people own a compendium of the social doctrine of the church? All right. Got one, two. Three. Excellent. Got a, a couple, and some of those people are actually board members. That's good. <laughs> those of you who haven't done that, you want to, might want to buy one. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, the actual, so we, on the educational piece, that's part of the important part of what we'll do at the chapter level. It's critical that we know what we're doing. We know what God is sending us to do. And like David practically said, it's kind of the, the manual for the compendium is the, like the manual for Catholics, Catholic laity to go out and transform the world. Um, but I, I, t- I was speaking with this friend of mine who's uh, unfortunately a fallen away Catholic and she was... I was sharing her what Vokari does, and, and I was talking about the compendium of the social doctrine of the church, and she's like, whoa, wait a second. She's like, you lost me at compendium. You know, like, what? You know, it's like, it's hard. It's actually, you know, for the person that's not really introduced into uh, the Catholic teaching and Catholic speak, compendium is just like, you know, it doesn't mean anything to them. In fact, it turns them away, you know. So we've got to actually do a better job at actually getting that wording, I think, really branded in a way that markets well. And so, you know, we, that's something that Vocari will work on to make that really accessible to all of you at the local level. I mean, the, really the Catholic guide to transforming the world is really what the compendium is. That's something people get. Wow, a guide to transform the world. That's pretty awesome. 
A compendium? Not so much. You know? <laughs> uh, so that educational piece is, is clearly key that we have to, um, that we have to engage on. So uh, before I touch upon the details on the, ed on the uh, education, I want to talk quickly about the calling, and that's really where we're evangelizing. And so people are, you know, important. It's important to many people that the, the church and we as lay people are actually, you know, have cognizant in our mind the need to evangelize. It's just what Father said. What is the mission of the church? Jesus said to go, you know, make disciples of all men and women. So that means evangelizing. But we have to be, begin to understand that evangelization actually has, I just started, <laughs> I'm laughing because I just started, it's been like five minutes and Anne-Marie gives me the 10 minute sign, like 10 minutes left. Anyway, I'll make this quick. Um, so we have to, uh, we have to actually uh, begin to uh, realize that this part, what we're doing in this, the, the Catholic social teaching is evangelizing, actually going out and serving our fellow, uh, serving humanity is actually evangelizing. And I was at three years in Olympia actually, you know, lobbying for our, our rights as Catholics um, or the, our rights or the issues, you know, the, the distinction now. But it took me three years to finally figure out that I was actually really evangelizing. I wasn't with a Bible. I wasn't actually trying to, you know, bring somebody to the church and, and to convert. But I was but I finally realized after a, a retreat I went on that I, I really was evangelizing. It's a form of evangelizing sharing this good news that the church has. And it's something that most lay people don't even realize. I was in religious life for seven years, and it took me three years after that to finally figure out I was actually evangelizing, but in a different modality, in a different way. And so it's a, something that we have to retrain our own thinking. Uh, uniting happens when we come together, praying and socializing together. It's really important that at the chapter level that you all make it fun you know, you really wanted it to be a social thing, that you want people to go there because they're having fun, they're actually interacting with like-minded Catholics, and, uh, and you want it to be, uh, a, you know, also f very familial. You want to bring in, you know, the young, and uh, you want to bring in parents and grandparents, everybody. You know, and as much as possible, you want to be able to actually, uh, br you know, have the children come in. So if, whatever it takes at your local level, and this is something that's across the board, you know, whatever's best for your local chapter. You want to, you know, you want to mold things according to your local area, how they best fit for, for all of you. Uh, keep that in mind on all levels, except the church teaching. There's no molding there. Well, it's pretty clear. Um, and so that having fun, we really want to uh, focus on that and really make that a very important. Uh, the second piece of that, and, and actually what I'm doing here is going over the basic uh, agenda of the chapter where you have mass first, we have the dinner or the social, then we have a teaching, then we discuss the teaching. It's really important, and, and Mark's actually going to do this after me. He's going to come together. He's going to teach us what, give us an example of a teaching, uh, one of the chapters in the compendium, which is what we'll do. We'll break up the compendium, which is 12 chapters, one a month. A year later, we've got the entire compendium completely, you know, studied and discussed and lived. So, in, and by living it, I mean we actually go out and take a, a charitable work that directly relates to the compendium's teaching, and then together we unite, go out into the community, and actually live it out in our red Vocari t-shirts. Right, Diego? Yeah. <laughs> and so we'll be able to really uh, show the, the community, um, and like Jim was telling me, uh, and on Vashon, and you guys all, I think you all know we have a Vashon Island chapter of Vocari. That's pretty cool. Um, and so... They were talking about how uh, Alan Vashon, Windermere is out there actually really doing charitable works, but the Catholic Church isn't. Like as a whole, to, you know, united together, and you see them out there actually, you know, doing these charitable works in the community at Alan Vashon. And this is something that they, they're getting excited about, where they can actually engage themselves as Catholics. Interestingly enough, the, the owner of uh, Windermere is Catholic. So we obviously have a job to do. It's in the hearts of all of us to get out there and do these things. We need to start doing it and making it really, you know, truly a Catholic, uh, Catholic endeavor. <clears throat> so um, this, uh, this unity is really important because, um, and it, this is something that's between, you know, varying competing uh, ministries, it's important that we realize that we have, and I touched upon this before about the unity 
about how Jesus prayed in John 17, what they, we call the priestly prayer of Jesus at the end of the Last Supper, when Jesus is just about to go off, to enter into his passion, to suffer and die and be crucified for us, he prays, Father, may they all be one as you and I are one. And we know that there's no, it's impossible to separate the distinction between Father and Son. And that's what Jesus was praying for us to have with our fellow brothers and sisters, especially in our own church. Now, if we're denied, divided in our own church, we're not obviously not living out this prayer of Jesus to be one. That's got to be something we really focus on. Otherwise, when we're out there, we're not really properly evangelizing and showing you know, the unity of Jesus himself. So uh, that brings us into the in, you know, engaging. Uh, and so there's, there's some rules of engagement that uh, I'm not going to touch upon. Basically, the main rule, and this is going to, at the state level, we'll work on, on the, actually what we will pick, the rule, the, the, the issues, if we ever get into an issue and actually, actually you know, advocate for it. It'll be something that's you know, 100% Catholic. It's not, a, it's not a how to do it. It's, it's going to be a, a directly on the issue. Is it, is it a Catholic issue or not? You know, we won't get into the how of doing a particular, a particular item. That's up for the resident experts who know how to, how to run a government, how to you know, run a, a, you know, an organization, a governmental organization. But if they're, if they're, if they're actually um, violating something serious like our religious freedoms, if our religious freedoms are at stake, that's when Vokari wants to step in and say, wait a minute, you know, we have a voice, we have a voice here, we have something to say about this. These are our rights, and we, we demand that you actually uh, give us our rights. Uh, and so those, that's a, just a basic distinction. There's some other rules we have for um, discerning issues. Um, but we'll get actually, we, we'll get, to, I mean, actually, I'll be able to, we'll get this up on the website, and then you'll be able to, you know, clearly access that. I think the, um, so I want to, I'm going to have questions held to the, to the end when we have a, this uh, Q&A coming up. But one thing I want to, uh, the, the leading to managing a, a chapter, the, the spirit I talked about earlier this morning is really the important key to that. It's actually making it really something that's welcome and welcoming to, to everybody. And uh, we want to actually enter into this, like Father was saying, about being you know, alive in the spirit and actually being out there joyfully serving. One of the things we, wanna, we want to do at the chapter level is to, to realize that when we were out there, we want, Jesus uh, wants, he wants all of us to be saints. He wants us to live fully of his grace, fully respond to his gospel, and to want to be saints, like they first called each other in the, in the Acts of the Apostles in the early church. So Vokari is doing that, responding to the call of the Holy Spirit, raising up saints to transform the world. Thank you. And so now I would like to um, introduce Mark. What we're going to do is that if you look at your schedule, we're going to flip things around a little bit because um, it'll just work for it better for the panel discussion to have it after Mark's, uh, after Mark's talk. So... Mark is, uh, speaking of evangelizing, an evangelist extraordinaire, convert to the faith, and obviously a prolific writer, as you can see at the table. Um, he's in, well, like Jody thought, he lived out east somewhere. He actually lives right here in Seattle. I do. Yeah. So we're, yeah, we're, we're really pleased to have Mark uh, in our community and right here today. So everybody give him a hand of, round of applause, please. Thank you. the efficiency and customary competence that uh, is so characteristic of me, uh, I totally didn't even know I was doing a presentation until like last week. Uh, and so John called and said, so you're ready to do that thing on small groups? I said, Duh, what? I don't even know anything about small groups. Oh, really? So I said, I could do something on chapter one of the compendium, because that's what I've been writing. Uh, he said, okay, do a talk on that, and then we'll have a small group thing after it. I said, so, okay, good. <laughs> so that's what we're doing today. So we are actually going to be talking about small groups, but we'll be doing it in the context of this discussion uh, of chapter one. So what I want to do is take us through a quick, a very quick, uh, about 15 minute or so, kind of flyover 
of chapter one of the compendium. And then when we're done with that, we've got discussion questions, which I'm just gonna go ahead and hand out now if you guys can just uh, hand them around to everybody in the room while we're talking. So to get right to it then, um, one of the things that you might have noticed about the discussion earlier when, when David was, was talking about the, the four pillars of Catholic social teaching was the reaction, different reactions from different people uh, to various aspects of Catholic social teaching. Um, Jody remarked, this sounds like communism at one point, and then, and then David said, yeah, this part sounds like Fox News, you know. Um, Catholic social teaching is very much, re the response in our culture to Catholic social teaching very much reminds me of the moment in Matthew's Gospel when Jesus looks at his disciples and says, who do people say I am? Uh, and everybody, wow, some people say this and other people say that and these other people say this over here. Um, that's very much the response of our culture to Catholic social teaching. So what is it? Is it Fox News? Is it, uh, is it communism? Where does it come from? Uh, surely it can't come from, you know, the Bible, right? It must come from somewhere else. Um, and in fact, what we discover is that the whole of Catholic social teaching springs out of apostolic tradition. So what we're going to do here is we're going to look at what are the roots in our tradition uh, from which all, and I mean all, of Catholic social teaching springs comes ultimately from biblical sources, apostolic sources. Catholic social teaching begins at the beginning uh, with the fact that God is the origin of all that exists and the measure of what should be. In short, it begins with the fact that creation is entirely gratuitous. Out of sheer love, God creates both the universe and us and calls us to share in his divine life, forgiving our sins and generously pouring himself out to us while calling, teaching, and enabling us to do as he does and become participants in his divine life. All authentic religious experience, says the compendium, takes us toward this reality, which is why the golden rule is universally recognized. Cats see no reason to be fair to mice. <laughs> but humans grasp that everybody is owed fair dealing, justice, etc., even when they won't admit it. In short, we recognize the fact that we are creatures made in the image and likeness of God. This primordial recognition of the moral law is called natural revelation and leads to supernatural revelation, beginning with the call of the people of Israel as God's chosen people. That happens not abstractly, but again by a purely gratuitous act, the exodus. By this act, God demonstrates to us that he loves us conditionally, unconditionally, wills our freedom, and desires us to have a home where we can flourish in a relationship of love with him and with our neighbor. Through it, Israel is not merely saved from slavery, but to the love of God and neighbor. And in particular, the poorest and weakest of one's neighbors, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt, as, e as Exodus puts it. But in order to be able to receive all the gratuitous love God wishes to pour out on Israel, merely getting them out of Egypt is not enough. Egypt must be gotten out of Israel, too. Therefore, the law and the covenant are given to teach Israel how to love and worship God rightly and how to love one's neighbor as oneself. In addition, Israel is commanded to celebrate the sabbatical and jubilee years in which debts were forgiven Slaves were to be set free. The idea was to make the liberating love of God an ongoing reality and not simply a once-upon-a-time event. Sadly, Israel ignored God's command and instead pursued the normal fallen desires for money, power, pleasure, honor, necessitating the rise of the prophets. Their message is simple and hard. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly with your God. The purpose of the prophet is to call Israel back to the covenant, but also to show them that the law is to be written on the heart and to promise the coming of the Messiah who will finally bring salvation. And that takes us back to Genesis. Because the biblical, for the biblical author, the revelation that God is creator is a profoundly personal realization that God has willed all of creation into being out of sheer love 
and most incredibly that he has called man and woman to be, quote, the visible sign and the effective instrument of divine gratuitousness in the garden where God placed them as cultivators and custodians of the goods of creation. You hear all that language echoing common good. The compendium goes on. It is in the free action of God, the creator, that we find the very meaning of creation, even if it has been distorted by the experience of sin. In the fall of man, our relationship with God and neighbor is profoundly damaged, but not destroyed. In this heritage of sin is to be found the root of all the ills Catholic social teaching calls us to redeem and heal with the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ. The compendium goes on. In Jesus Christ, the decisive event of the history of God with mankind is fulfilled. Jesus, God made man, fulfills the old covenant. So, for instance, Jesus opens his ministry by applying the image of the jubilee. Remember, we just talked about that. To himself, by proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord. He does not mean he is declaring a jubilee year to begin his ministry. He means he is the jubilee, setting us free from the slavery and debt of sin, just as he will later say that he is the true bread of life prefigured by the manna in the wilderness, and he is the true temple prefigured by the stone building in Jerusalem. The new covenant is hidden in the old, and the old is fully revealed in the new. Jesus lives in the love of his Father and offers to share his divine life with us in the ultimate exodus from sin, hell, and death to the freedom and life of the children of God. He tells us all that the Father has is mine. Accordingly, just as God's work in creating the universe, giving us life and revealing himself to us and through the covenant of, with Israel is entirely gratuitous, that's a word that you will hear over and over again. You'll notice that, gratuitous. Uh, so the even greater work of redeeming us from sin is even more gratuitous, generous, and superabundant. In becoming man, suffering and dying for our sins and rising again, Jesus becomes, quote, the example and pattern of this for his disciples. Jesus' followers are called to live like him, and after his Passover in de of death and resurrection, to live also in him and by him, thanks to the superabundant gift of the Holy Spirit, the consoler who internalizes Christ's own style of life in human hearts, unquote. More than this, we discover that God is love, that within God himself is an eternal dynamic of love in which the Father pours out his love to the Son, the Son gives back to the Father all the love he receives, and the union of love between them is the Holy Spirit. And this ultimate revelation of the very nature of God shines forth in the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ. In him and through him, all human beings are granted access into the divine life of the Blessed Trinity and become partakers in the divine nature poured out on us in the gift of the Holy Spirit. Through our obedience to his command that you love one another even as I have loved you, we live in Christ the Trinitarian life within the church, the body of Christ, and transform history until it reaches its fulfillment in the heavenly Jerusalem. This revelation again happens not in cloud cuckoo land, but in human history. Therefore, we must pay attention to the signs of the times, says the church. This is why the church responds to the fact that we now live in a global culture and tells us that, quote, it accentuates once more in the light of revelation a new model of the unity of the human race, which must ultimately inspire our solidarity, unquote. Because God is a communion of persons, and we are in his image and likeness, it is not good for man to be alone. We are essentially social creatures, called to live in love like him, and we cannot find our true meaning in life apart from doing so. Our free so self-donation in love is offered above all to God, but also to our neighbor. And since Christ redeems all creation, even extends to the whole of creation, as we tend the garden to the glory of God, and the good of others. And so all politics, all arts, all the sciences, everything gets taken up in the work of redemption. The compendium tells us, quote, the salvation offered in its fullness to men in Jesus Christ 
concerns the human person in all his dimensions, personal and social, spiritual and corporeal, historical and transcendent. Therefore, the church cannot and must not merely stick to praying and must involve itself in the whole of human existence. At the same time, the church rejects theocracy. Our free response to God cannot be forced and must be given not as a servile slave, but in the spirit of Christ the Son. Of course, we are not capable in our own strength of the kind of sacrificial self-denial necessary to love as Christ loves. Therefore, Jesus is not merely our model. He must also supply us with the grace of his risen and divinized life through the sacraments. At the same time, God is not bound by the sacraments and works in the lives of those outside the visible church. Therefore, we are bound to think and act in love for every human person and for the created world, including, by the way, our enemies. This requires both balance and the ability to prioritize our loves. In Christ, we are to love God above all things, one's neighbor is oneself, and the created world is a gift of God in that order. We are also to recognize that various disciplines in human affairs have their own kind of autonomy. There is no such thing as Catholic math or Catholic science or Catholic government per se. The church is not a micromanaging totalitarian state, but the sacrament of freedom for human flourishing in the rightly ordered love of God and neighbor. At the same time, the world can neither contain nor satisfy us, so we must not seek our fulfillment only in the things of this world, since we find our ulti ultimate happiness in God. The church is, above all, not a human organization. It is the primary sacrament, quote, a sign and instrument, that is, of communion with God and of unity among all men. Her mission is ultimately to get us to heaven. But as always, she begins right here on earth. So she welcomes any person of goodwill who lives gospel values and is open to the working of the spirit, who breathes when and where he wills. Since the church is to be in this world but not of it, she can never be identified with any particular political, social, or philosophical movement. Likewise, the church rejects the notion that we can create a utopian heaven on earth and no earthly good can replace him in the human soul. Such idolatry always leads to death. Salvation is social. We are baptized not into a me and Jesus relationship, but into a, a relationship with Christ the head and his body, the church. Moreover, we are also called into a relationship with every human person. Since Jesus died for all, and is present and in union with the least of these. To live this out in the real world requires what the compendium calls creative responsibility. Since there is no formula or one size fits all way to engage the world. Uh, God is the, uh, the way of love that is open to all people. And, that, and says that the effort to establish a universal brotherhood will not be in vain. We are called to transform the world while bearing in mind that our ultimate goal is eternal life, the resurrection, and a new heaven and a new earth where all the good things we have loved will be perfected in Christ, not in a utopian, secular heaven on earth. And the great sign of this is Mary, the first disciple to receive in fullness both the grace of God and the reward of heaven in a glorified human body and soul. As our mother, entrusted by Jesus to us from the cross itself, she is the great icon of the church, to whom we look in order not only to know how we must live, but what great reward we can expect from the God who is love. That, in very compressed form, is what the first chapter of the compendium has to say to us. And you'll you'll notice that what's happening here is the church is laying the theological groundwork for everything that's going to follow. The church is saying that we're not just coming up with this from nowhere. This is all coming out of the biblical tradition. Uh, what's my time? Uh, you're good. We have half an hour. 
Okay. So what we're going to try to do is actually, um, thanks so much, Mark. Sure. You can stay right here. What? You can just, you can just stay right here. I'll what, just stay right here. What, we'll, what we're, we're thinking do about what John doing says. is actually breaking out into small groups. Uh, like we would have at the local chapter level, we would break down into small groups to discuss what we were just taught, like Mark just taught us the first chapter of the compendium. So we get down and break in small groups, discuss it for you know for a certain period of time. What I think we'd like to do is what I'd like to do is to get feedback from all of you. So if we could break down to small groups and and have a small group discussion for because we're going to have time for transitions for about 15 minutes, then come back and then give us input on on how it went, how we could improve things. Um, and so it's part of it, partially teaching teaching for for all of you on what exactly would happen at the chapter level. You know, you would have the, the social event, you'd get up and have a teaching, then you'd break out into small uh, groups to discuss it, and then you would go into, uh, into the next action sort of phase of the, the chapter uh, event. So if we could now, like, go ahead and actually take uh, maybe, maybe three, about five or six people, we could actually come over to these tables over here if you want, and so just... John, just to be clear, are, are we not going we are, exactly. We are. Oh, we are gonna yeah, yeah, that's why we have these, yeah. Okay. So is, is one group going to pick one discussion question, or are we going to discuss all five? No, that's up to the group, the discussion leader, like the, the one who's the heading the, the discussion. How much time do we have? Well, typically at a, at a, on a chapter, at a chapter, uh, you know, um, event, you would have, uh, let's see, 30 minutes to go through the discussions. So you get 15 minutes of, of teaching and then 30 minutes of discussion. We really want people to actually engage more and begin to discuss things. Uh, you know, it's it's a short period of time. We we realize, but we also have a lot of people that are. It's going to be around at this time. It'll be about you know, uh, seven forty-five. No, it's seven thirty at night. So we want to actually move things and get people to a discussion so they're not falling asleep. You know, at seven thirty at night. Uh, so we so we'd have normally thirty minutes to discuss this. And if like as Jim was saying, if you're a Vashon. You may not have to, may not have to move for your small group discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody, come in, come up, and file in, and just take a seat at the table. And as it fills in, we'll, we'll uh, get started. Okay.